Now an, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and, say, and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading is Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is a passage of a scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and a lamp before its shared is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with a verse passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can I stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and Philip baptized them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Asotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. How are you all doing this morning? Good, good. Uh, so yeah, I'm guessing at this point you would have had your, your Bibles open to, to the teaching text. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to verse 14. It's always a privilege for me to be able to share God's word with you, um, to share God's word, period, but to be able to share God's word with um, Fellowship City, with our church, and it's a, it's a privilege once again for me to be here this morning. Um, so a quick series recap, we've, as, as Raina mentioned, we're in season two of the book of Acts. Um, the past four weeks, week four today, the first two weeks we were looking at Acts chapter 6. We looked at challenges in the church. The second week we looked at Christ-likeness. Um, and last week we looked at a gospel that cannot fail, but a faith that can. Um, and today we're looking at uh, a phrase from the text, do you understand what you're reading? Um, Philip asked the Ethiopian eunuch. And so today the title of our message is God is at work. God is at work. As we sit in church this morning, God is at work. As we sit in our joy and our distress, God is at work. Our God is alive and our God is active and involved in the life and in the lives of his people. I have an image that I want to show you, and this is in contrast. This is a, this is a very critical theological truth for us to sort of start our message with. There's this worldview called deism, which uh, consists of people who believe that God created the world, he created everything in it, he wound it up like a clock, and then he stood back, folded his arms, and then he just let the world continue as it is. So this worldview believes that God is not involved in the world. That's not what we believe. In Christianity, as we look at the scriptures, we see this next image shows us that God has the world not only in his hands and in the palm of his hands, but his fingers and his hands are, in, are intimately involved in our everyday lives. And so in Acts chapter 6, verses 26 to 40, we're going to see how God is at work, and we're going to, 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 to come out with a couple of principles as we look at the life of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Three things we're going to look at this morning. One, God speaks. Two, God sends. And three, God saves. Three simple truths, yet still so profound. Let me pray for us this morning. 
please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day. We thank you for the gift of another day, Lord. Thank you for each person that is here this morning, Father. Thank you, as always, that no one is here by chance. That everyone who's here is here because you wanted them here, Father. And so I ask this morning, we ask collectively that you may speak to us, Father. Open up our hearts, open up our minds, give us the ability to hear what you have to say to us as a church and as individuals, Lord. Speak through me this morning, Heavenly Father, I pray. Be with the words I speak, the things you want us to emphasize on from our teaching text this morning. Bless our time together. These things we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God speaks. As we get straight into our first point, we see in the teaching text that in verse 26 it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip. In verse 29 we see that the Spirit told Philip. So already we see we, we, we serve a God who speaks to his people. He speaks to us in a variety of ways. We also see then, he, we see God speaking through his word, verses 28, verse 30, all the way through to verse 35 as the Ethiopian eunuch is reading the scriptures. And then we see in verse 40, Philip then preaches the gospel. And in preaching the gospel, he, God, God speaks to his people. So four ways, four key ways that we see God speaking to his people in this text. And we can see then in the world that God speaks in these ways. One, through angels. Two, through his spirit. Three, through his word. And four, through people. And as we take a step back and we see from the Old Testament all the way through to the, through to the, to the New Testament, we see that God also additionally speaks through dreams. We saw this with Joseph, um, who, 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 who was the interpreter of dreams. And he said, it's not I, but it's God who gives the answers to these dreams. And then we see with Joseph, the father of Jesus, at Jesus' birth, when he wanted to divorce Mary secretly, the Bible says an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and spoke to him. So we see God speaking in different ways, and, and oftentimes in Scripture we also see God himself speaking directly. Um, we see uh, Moses at the burning bush. We see Moses at the top of Mount Sinai, and in a variety of different contexts. So God speaks, church. Our God speaks to us. He speaks through us. And so before we can even go any further in understanding the work that God does, may we be reminded that he's a God who speaks. There are people here, there are people in the world who say, yo, I wish God would speak to me. The easiest access point to hearing God's voice is for us to read the scriptures. Easiest access point. And by the way, there are many people across the world who actually don't have access to God's word. God speaks. Secondly, God sends. So our first two points will go pretty quickly. We'll focus on God's save. So, so our second point is God sends. He's a God who sends. Verse 26, you see, he's, so the angel of the Lord said to Philip, and he said, go south to the road, to the desert road. In verse 29, the Bible says, the Spirit told him, go to that chariot and stay near it. And as he goes, we see the first time that the angel said go, and in verse 27 it says, he met with an Ethiopian eunuch. So in, ver in verse 27 when it says go, go to the chariot, in verse 30 Philip goes, and in his going he hears the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch reading the scriptures out loud, and then he asks some questions. So there are two things that we understand about God sending out. He's a, he's a God who sends out, and in his sending out, He's a God who sends two. So he sent Philip out, but he never sends out in a vacuum. He's sending out to a specific context and for a specific reason. And in the story, he sent Philip out, and as he sent Philip out, Philip went in to the Ethiopian eunuch. And so, we, and, and, and we see God operating this way throughout scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, when Isaiah is, is, is seeing the throne of God, he's seeing the creatures singing, holy, holy, holy. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips, living among, amongst the people of unclean lips. And, and, and then God says, who can we send? Isaiah puts up his hand. He says, here I am, Lord, send me. And he, he sent him 
to speak to the people of God. So whenever God sends, he sends out and he sends to. This is how, how he answers our prayers. This is what he does. This is how he meets our needs. We see in, in the first few chapters of the book of Exodus, the people of, of God were crying out, saying, Lord, save us. We're in bondage and we're in slavery. God hears their cries. And what does he do? He calls out Moses goes into, into the wilderness, he comes back and he is sent out into the people of God. So, so, so you know, we, we talk about the fact that when we ask God to, to, to meet our needs or when we pray to God, we always need to be conscious that he may provide in a way that we're not looking out for or that we're not expecting. And so may we ask the Spirit of God to show us when he's moving, when he's speaking, when he's sending out. As we go back to our teaching text, you'll see in verse 30 and verse 31, again, so Philip was sent out, he was sent out to the eunuch. Look at what this looks like practically. So in verse 30 and verse 31, he's, Philip is told to, to go out, right? He ran to the chariot and he heard the man reading. Because he went out, he asked the question, do you understand what you're reading? The Ethiopian eunuch is like, man, perfect timing because I actually don't. I don't know what I'm reading. He, he goes on to say, unless someone explains it to me, how will I know? He couldn't figure it, figure it out himself. And God knew that. He, he, he heard him longing for him and he sent someone out to him. Have a look at verses 34 to 35. The eunuch asked Philip, so, so, so he was sent to him, he, he asked him if he understands, he then said in verse 34, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And because Philip was obedient and was sent out, he was then able to, to, to with, from that very passage in scripture in verse 35, he told him the good news about Jesus. And then again in verse 36, he goes on to say, okay, there's a body of water. I'd love to get baptized. Do you think he can baptize himself? Not even Jesus could baptize himself, right? <laughs> and so God knew that. God knew the Ethiopian eunuch needed someone for a variety of reasons. He said, Lord, I want to get baptized. And once he was there, Philip, having been sent out, was to baptize him. So, so, so in our lives, God, God might be sending us out or he might be sending people to us. We need to be attentive to that. But at the end of the day, God is at work. God is always at work. Philip was sent out and he was sent to the Ethiopian eunuch. And then in verse 39 and 40, notice there, the Bible says the spirit took Philip away the Ethiopian eunuch saw him no more, and he sent him out elsewhere. He appeared at Azotus all the way through to Caesarea and continued preaching the gospel. God is in the business of sending out his people to meet his people's needs. Okay, before we go to the third, our third and final point where we'll, 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 we'll land, I want to note something about the Ethiopian eunuch. Something that I think we can, learn, we can learn a lot from. The Ethiopian eunuch was searching for God. He was seeking after God. In fact, he wasn't just seeking after him, he was longing for him with great eagerness and zeal. Why do I say that? Have a look at his actions. So in verse 27, the Bible tells us, there's some details that the Bible included for a specific reason. It tells us that he went to Jerusalem to worship. So what we then understand about this is, remember, he's, it says, the Bible says he's an Ethiopian eunuch, which means he's not a Jew. So there's one of two options. One, he was either a proselyte to Judaism, which basically means he was a converted Jew, or, at the very least, he was a Gentile God-fearer. One of two options. Either way, he, he took a, a, a sacrifice and he went a long way to look and search for God. 
Secondly, it tells us that he's a eunuch. Now, as a eunuch, the Jewish law would forbid eunuchs to enter the temple. Deuteronomy 23 verse 1 clearly articulates that, and though there are scriptures later on in the Old Testament that speak about ways in which eunuchs and Gentiles could access God, there was still very likely contention and restrictions when he got to the temple. Right? Because the Bible tells us that because he would have been prohibited, there would have been specific areas that he could go into as a Gentile who's there to worship God. So one... He's a convert, and there were certain decisions he needed to make to show his commitment to God. No one forced him to go to Jerusalem. Living in Ethiopia, there was no reason for him to go to Jerusalem. He wanted God. Secondly, because he was a eunuch, he understood very well that there would be implications and hurdles and challenges for him. Thirdly, the Bible tells us he traveled to Jerusalem. Traveling. So, Ethiopia is, 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 is historically, uh, historians tell us that it's what would have been referred to back then as Nubia, which sort of today is sort of Upper Sudan. It would take a couple weeks, several weeks to travel from home to Jerusalem, one way. Several weeks, again, I'm talking about his desire for God. The Bible then also tells us that he was a senior official overseeing the finances of the queen. It's like our, the equivalent of a minister of finance. Our minister of finance is, is, is uh, the Honorable Mr. Enoch Godongwan. Probably pronounced that incorrectly. What historians note, though, as we would imagine, our minister of finance, our ministers cannot travel alone. It's a safety concern. There's security protocols. So he would have had an entourage, and that entourage would have been very expensive. Again, I'm walking you through the things he had to go through to try and find God. This wouldn't have been on, on, on uh, the, the government's bill. <laughs> he would have had to cover this himself. Go by boat, go by sea. And lastly, this was pre-publishing, by the way. So, in 2022, we get copies of the Bible, and I'm spoiled. I've got multiple copies of the Bible digitally on, on, on my Bible app, version. Now, during that time, you know, we glance over the fact that he had a copy of Isaiah, a personal copy of Isaiah. <laughs> so, historians tell us that only the wealthy had access to their personal books in any form, religious or non-religious. It says a scribe would have taken them up to a year to copy and write the book of Isaiah for him to have his own copy. Again, he didn't ask the government to pay for it. It's very likely he paid out of, out of his own pocket. These are the things. So, 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 so I'm not saying that for God to send people out to meet your needs, you need to have this desire for him. I'm saying in the Bible, it's telling us about an Ethiopian eunuch, and he had a longing for God. The things he went through. He said, Lord, I'm looking for the truth. I'm searching for, for my creator. And what I'm, what I'm seeing and what I'm living and what I'm realizing, it's, it's, there's something missing. And then we look at his attitude. So these are all the things around, simply just around him. Now when we get into the text again and we see the specifics, let's look at his attitude. In verse 30, the Bible tells us, so he's, he's gone through all these lengths. He's got the copy of, of the book of Isaiah. What does the Bible tell us? He's reading it, reading it out loud. He comes across Philip, and what does he do? He asks questions. He engages. He says, Philip, come in. Come into my secure Public transportation or private transportation. Go through the security. I'll give you clearance because I want you to sit right next to me and talk to me about the scriptures. He was searching and seeking for God. In verse 36 to 38, we see to the point where he, he got the answers he was looking for. 
And then he wants to take action. If there's a man, if ever there's a man or a woman or a person who's searching for God, look at the Ethiopian eunuch. Psalm 42, verse 1, the scripture says, As a deer pants for water, so my soul longs for God. That, that was the Ethiopian eunuch's posture. May, may God help us. Lord, may you help us to long for you the way the Ethiopian eunuch longed for God. Because by the way, God is listening. God, God is waiting for us. Have a look at the scripture. Jeremiah 29, verse 12 to 14 so we know the infamous passage, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. This is the broader context in which the scripture is found. God then says, you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Church, God is not a God who's playing hide and seek and laughing at you because you can't find him. God is saying, come to me. My arms are wide open. My ears are open. I'm longing for you to long for me. He's waiting for us, church. He says, I'm here. F come, come, f come look for me. Come find me. God sends. So, so all this was within the ambit of, so God is at work. He speaks and he sends. And as he sends, he sends with and for a purpose. Sends people out. And in the same vein, he sends people too. Third and final point, God saves. So, so the thing I love about the question that or more so the answers to the question is, the, let, me, let me make sure I'm keeping track of my time. The, there's, 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 there's something very profound about saving. Not financially saving, but, but saving, like we discussed in the question, right? Because every single person in this room has a reference point to saving. Dare I say to salvation. Not salvation within the context of Jesus, but salvation in the pure English definition. The need for saving. So Reino talks about the fact that his daughter was in front of him and she needed saving from that situation regardless of whether she knew it or not. Reino was able to appreciate the saving. There were examples of kids being saved. Those things that we love being saved. So, so, so if we can hold on to that appreciation of a need for saving, we multiply that significantly when we think about our need for salvation and for saving. So when we say God saves, it's very easy for us to think, no, but I don't need saving. I'm, I'm not in, in a near disaster. No, 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 no. Sin has put us in a disastrous situation. We need saving. Praise the Lord, he's a God who saves. So God's work, again, God is at work. So God's work is centered around the salvific work of Jesus. That simply means the saving work of Jesus. So God's work is centered around the saving work of Jesus. That's the gospel. Matthew, 1, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible tells us the day Jesus was born, Angel said to Joseph, you shall name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Literally, the, 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 the purpose for which he came was to save. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He's a God who saves. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, Paul says, I give to you as of first importance what I received. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was crucified and buried, and he was, he was raised from the dead. 2 Corinthians chapter, 9, chapter 5, verse 19, this is within the context of, for those who are in Christ are a new creation. 
the old is gone, the new has come. And then the Bible says, for God is reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ. So, so, so it's not just about being saved from hell. Reconciliation says, I want you back in an intimate relationship with me the way I intended it to be. God saves. So that's the gospel. This is the mission of God. Since the beginning of creation, in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned, as, as God is, is giving sort of the rebuke and the commands to, to, to Adam, to Eve, and to the serpent, verse, chapter 3, verse 15, he says, speaking to the serpent, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This, this is theologically referred to as one of the first few messianic prophecies, which we'll see again in Isaiah 53 where God was giving a, 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 a sort of a foretaste of Jesus and ultimately the work that he was going to do. The profoundness of God is the moment we sinned, he already had a solution. The moment sin was introduced to humanity, God said, I know the, the solution. And that was Jesus. So when we talk about the gospel church, when we talk about God saving and God being at work, he's always been at work. He, he continues to be at work, and he will always be at work. God saves. He's in the business of saving. He's in the business of saving his people, his creation. Now as we look at Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40, our teaching text, verse 32 and verse 33, this is the portion from Isaiah that they, Philip, the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip are reading. Now, to to, to honor the text and to honor the teachings of Jesus, we're going to look at the, the, the text in its entirety. Thank you, Rudolph. Again, I, I, I don't want us to just read a portion. This is an entire chapter talking about the, the future coming of Jesus Christ. So let's take the time to read through it. From verse 13, see my servant will act wisely so it starts in chap chapter 52, verse 13, and it goes all the way through to the entirety of chapter 53. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up highly and exalted, lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his, and his form was marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or, or, or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yes, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. By, by his knowledge and my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of the many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is talking about Jesus. If ever you have time, read Isaiah chapter 53. The title is The Suffering Servant. 
As I mentioned earlier, it's known as a, a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy about the Messiah to come. And it's, it's one of the, 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 the sort of the, the most popular examples of Jesus being spoken about in the Old Testament. And as we see the scripture, we understand the fact that Jesus had not come yet when the scripture was written. But in the book of Acts, as the apostles go on their way, they confirm that he did come. This indeed is that Messiah that we've learned about for generation upon generation, that we've longed for, for years to come. This is him. He came and he fulfilled this prophecy. And then have a look at Acts chapter 8, verse 35 in our teaching text. So having shared, so the Bible says in verse 34 that, so he asked, is, who is this talking about? Then Philip said, he began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news. So he would have given him the context. He would have then added additional scriptures to talk about who Jesus was. When you talk about being a gospel-centered church, this is the Jesus that we talk about. And then, one would imagine, um, he would have concluded, so Philip, again, so he's, he's presenting, he's explaining this text. He's preaching the gospel. One would imagine he would conclude it the same way that the other apostles concluded it. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 8, Peter presented the gospel, and at the end he said, therefore, they asked, how do we respond? He says, repent, therefore, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And why do we say that? Why do we say he would have probably ended like that? Because in verses 36 to 8, we see the, 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 the Ethiopian eunuch then says, hey, there's a body of water. You were talking about baptism. Yo, there's a body of water. Can I get baptized? <laughs> to which Philip said, come on, let's go. He baptized him. And that's our story. Verse 39, the Bible says Philip is taken away. The eunuch went on rejoicing, and then Philip went on preaching. This is, this is a, it's a simple yet very layered story. So we ask the question, what does this mean for us? We end on, we end on these three points. We've heard the gospel, we've seen the responses to the gospel, we've read this story that was written years ago, we understand that God is at work. So what does this mean for us? One, be encouraged. Be encouraged, because God is at work. The reason I love Waymaker is because that What's it called? The bridge? The, the end? Even when I don't see it. What's he doing? <laughs> Even when I don't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. Sure. Profound stuff. So be encouraged. Regardless of our reality, regardless of what may be frustrating us, leading us to anxiety, keeping us up at night, regardless of the unknown of tomorrow, be encouraged. Because God is at work. For some of us, so, so Jeremiah 29 that I referenced, he says, years and years later, I will then free you, but you're going to have to stay in that captivity for years. So for some of us, we're going to be in our situations for a long time. I don't know how long. For some of us, as soon as we leave the church this morning, God is going to answer our prayer. That's just the way it is. Regardless, may we be encouraged. Because the Bible teaches that God is at work. God is at work. Secondly, be attentive. Be attentive. Have ears to, to listen. Have eyes to see. 
Look around you. Look at where God might be working. Look at where God might be speaking. Where God might be sending. Open up your heart and, and your mind to, to see, to, to understand. Let's not let our first instinct to be frustrated or to be angry or to to do things our own way. No, no, no. God is at work always. Always, church. Therefore, may we ask the Spirit of God, like Philip was in tune to, to one, the angel saying, go, two, the Spirit saying, move closer to that chariot. May we ask God to help us be attentive. May he give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to comprehend. And lastly, be proactive. Be proactive. Um, okay, so, so we've got like three more minutes and we're done. Eh? For some of you, it's going to be a session of rebuke the next few minutes. For some of you, it's going to be a session of encouragement. The Spirit of the Lord, may He be upon us to receive it whichever way we receive it. God is at work. Philip responded proactively. Matthew 7, 24 says, anyone who hears these words and puts them to practice is like a wise man building a house on a rock. James 1, 22, don't just listen to the words, but do what the word says. For if you listen to the words and you don't do what the word says, you're like a person who looks at the mirror, turns away and forgets immediately what they look like. Luke eleven twenty eight. blessed are those who hear the word and do it. So the Bible says, act on the words that the Bible teaches. What does this look like for us practically? For some of us, it's a moment to repent. For some of us, this is a moment when God says, stop your wickedness right now. Stop what you're doing. For some of us, whether we've never repented to God before or whether we've been following Jesus for years, but we're doing the things we shouldn't be doing. The word says repent right now. Repentance means I acknowledge the sin before me. I acknowledge, Lord, that I've done wrong. And I turn around. I've been walking away from you. I repent and I turn around and I look at the cross again. For some of us, we need to repent today. For some of us, we need to obey. We need to obey. Philip received an instruction. He didn't question God. He obeyed immediately. Some of us this morning, God is telling us, obey, you've heard me and you've heard me clearly. Do what I told you to do. Obey. For some of us, we need to be like the Ethiopian eunuch. We need to seek. We need to hunger We need to long for God more than we've ever done before. We we need to desire God. We need to seek after him, pursue him, like we see the Ethiopian eunuch doing. It'll come at a cost. But for some of us, we need to learn from the Ethiopian eunuch. For others of us, We need to have a fire and a passion like Philip did for Jesus and for the gospel, for the work of God. We need to join him. So so, so one pastor said we make the mistake of saying, Lord, come and join me on what I'm doing for you. He says, no, God is at work. He's on a mission. We should ask him to join him on what he's doing. Some of us, we need to have that fire and that passion. We see Philip and the apostles in the book of Acts. And lastly, for some of us, we need to just be still. (sighs) 
to just be still. Isaiah says, be still and know that I am God. That's what some of us are supposed to do. We're so quick to take things into our own hands and do things and solve. For some of us, God is saying, stop. Just stop. Just listen. Trust me. And wait on me. Trust him and wait patiently for him. May God encourage us this morning. May he help us to be attentive. May he help us to be proactive. Let's pray this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We we thank you that you speak in many ways to us. Thank you for speaking to us this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your spirit moves among us and, and, and that a message that can be to the church at large can be to me, Murendeni, as an individual too. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, Lord. Allow us to hear what you're saying to us this morning. Thank you for the theological truth that says God is at work. Always. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless your people this morning. We're all going through different things. We're all in different seasons. Our realities are not the same. But meet each one of us where we are. Help us to reach out to you. Help us to to search for you because your word says we will be found by you if we search for you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for blessing us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name.